I'm going to go ahead and get started. First off, thank you to everyone who's here right now taking time out on a Sunday. Um, my name is Tisha. I am a part of Globe Med at Rhodes. We're just like a health organ uh, equity organization. So putting on some educational events and then also doing fundraisers for our grassroots partner, Amos. Um, and this is one of our last events for this semester. So we're really glad you guys are all able to come join us. Um, this event specifically has been pretty long time coming. Um, the farmers protests have been ongoing for quite a while and is pretty much outside of mainstream media at this point. I think if it wasn't for me following some niche Instagram and Twitter accounts, it also wouldn't be on my feed as well. So we're really glad everyone is here taking the time out to educate themselves on something that, you know, is so ongoing and present in India specifically at the moment. But I am not here to lecture you, um, as I am not at all an expert on the farmers' protests. Um, I am also here to learn. So I would like to introduce our two amazing panelists. First, we have Manpreet Kaur. Manpreet Kaur is a Khalsa Aid International USA director and New York chapter lead, leading all the SEVA projects in New York State, including New York City, as well as supporting the National Khalsa Aid Organization. And Khalsa Aid International is an international NGO with the aim to provide humanitarian aid in disaster areas and civil conflict zones around the world. The organization is based upon the Sikh principle of recognize the whole human race as one. Khalsa Aid USA is 100% volunteer based and launched in January of 2019. Khalsa Aid International has been providing on ground amenities and resources to support the farmers right to protest since the beginning of the movement in November, 2020 thereby allowing the farmers to protest with dignity. And then we also have Kanupriya, who is having a little bit of technical difficulties, but hopefully will be joining soon. Also a huge shout out to her because it is 1.30 a.m. in India right now. So she is up late for us. Um, but Kanupriya is a MA student um, in the Department of Women's Studies and Development. She was also formerly Punjab University Students Council Union President. So we are very happy to have these amazing panelists here um, to hear about the work of Khalsa Aid, student activists in India, and the ongoing protests in general. Um, we will have a Q&A session after our panelists speak, so free, feel, feel free to put your questions into the chat. Um, you can use the Q&A function or just DM me and I can read them afterwards. Um, but with that, I will turn it over to our wonderful panelists. Great, thank you. I am going to try and um, share. Um, I did create a, uh, a PowerPoint, so just let me know if you can view this. Okay, right. Um, so I wanted to um, thank you all for inviting me to, to speak here. Um, at, at the session about the farmers' protest. Um, just to give a bit of background in terms of what I'm gonna speak about, and I know it's about 15 to 20 minutes, so I'm gonna try and keep to time. Um, I'm gonna give a bit of an introduction to Khalsa Age International, um, and then launch into just um, the background of the farmers' protest, what the bills are about, um, and, and essentially why it's happening. Um, and then talk about the impact of the bills and some of the activism that we've seen within the Western media. Um, and then also talk about the CASA aid um, support that has been uh, provided on, on the ground. So as, as uh, Tiasha mentioned, um, we are an international humanitarian organization. CASA aid was uh, created um, in 1999 um, by our founder, Ravi Singh, in the UK. He essentially saw the plight of the Kosovan refugees at the time. Um, there was a civil conflict ongoing in Europe, and the, and the refugees were really suffering. And he felt, uh, whilst walking around the Vasaki uh, parade at the time, back in 99, um, that there was more that we could do. And he essentially, you know, got some people together, got some funding together, and, and launched this, the first um, mission for Khalsa Aid to Kosovo. The principle is Sarvatapala, which means uh, prosperity for all. Um, and it's essentially, the, the concept is if, if 
one part of the human race is not doing well, then essentially we're not all we're all not doing well. So we recognize the whole human race as one, and that means supporting um, humanity regardless of uh, race, gender, sexual orientation, country, um, any anything that that kind of divides us. We we don't see that as a division. We see that as a recognition of the entire whole human race, and and we will reach out and provide. Uh, support and aid um, wherever that is that is required. Uh, we do have chapters in the UK. That was our first chapter, um, also in Canada, India, Australia, and the USA. As Tiasha said, we started in, in 2019 in the USA, and we have chapters pretty much um, across the, the, the states. So um, if anyone is interested in volunteering with Class Aid, um, please do reach out and, um, and, and let, let us know. I've been a volunteer with Cause for Age since 2019 and recently stepped up as a, um, as a director for, for the USA, for the USA group. Um, in terms of the, the, the uh, types of favor that we do within the US, um, it is very much about supporting the underserved community. Um, it's about working within our communities, the communities that we uh, live in right now, which is what we would classify as our Sangat. Um, and these are underserved communities, undocumented individuals, Native American um, individuals, um, homeless, domestic violence, women, children's issues, uh, veterans. So anyone that is marginalized or un underserved. So in terms of the farmers protest, so <clears throat> to give a, a, a kind of a quick um, rundown, and then this is going to be quick because this is a very deep and in, in, in quite an intense topic, um, and I could talk about it for quite some time, so I'm gonna try and keep it um, succinct. Essentially, three bills were introduced um, into Parliament in September 2020, and they were rushed through Parliament. There was very limited discussion going on. Um, during the parliamentary session, this was at the, obviously the height of the COVID pandemic. There were a lot of um, members of Parliament that were not um, present when these uh, bills were were discussed, um, and they were passed in Parliament um, using, I would say, um, it's questionable whether they were actually passed, because if you see some of the videos, it's not very clear whether um, the, uh, the members of Parliament were saying a yes or a no um, in terms of, uh, you know, passing the bills. But they were passed through Parliament, and they were signed by the President in India in September 2020. Now, there's three bills, the Farmers, Produce, Trade and Commerce Bill, uh, the Essential Commodities Act, and then the Farmers Empowerment and Protection um, Agreement on Price Assurance. And it's important that you look at all three bills in their in entirety and not look at them separately, because it, in their entirety, what they're trying to do is loosen the, the rules and the laws that are um, surrounding how you sell produce um, how pro produce is priced and also how it is stored. Um, and I think this is very key in terms of understanding why, why this is an issue and why this is such a problem um, and a concern for the farmers in India. What this is essentially saying is, um, as a uh, private buyer, so it's, it's uh, opening up, up the market to private buyers. Um, prior to the, to the bills, um, within the states, you would have to, if you were, if you were selling your um, produce, you would have the opportunity to go to what's called an APMC, which is an agricultural produce um, uh, market, um, sorry, an agricultural uh, produce marketing committee. So it's APMC. It's also called Mundi. So essentially, you would go to this Mundi as a farmer and you could sell your product through the Mundi. And these are government regulated. Um, when you're selling your product through the Monday, you would also be offered a, a minimum set price, so an MSP, uh, which means that you have a floor price and you can you sell your product through through that. So as a farmer, you know that this is where you're gonna and this is how and where you're gonna sell your product. You also um, there are also limitations on how much produce can be hoarded, so how how much produce can be bought and stored, um, and. Uh, so what these rules are trying, essentially saying is we're taking away the APMC, uh, the MSPs uh, not being applied, and um, private buyers who can enter the market can also um, store the, the produce. 
it's also allowing for contract farming. And I'll, I'll touch on that in a minute. Now, right now, um, the reason that these were introduced is that there are inefficiencies in the current system in terms of how um, the product is being sold and, um, you know, the just in terms of um, the, the amount of power that is being placed in the hands of the middlemen and the middlemen or the traders are the ones that are kind of the intermediaries that operate within the APMC or what they would classify as the, in, in Hindi, they would call them Arthias. So these APMCs were established back in, 19, in the 1960s. And the reason that they were established is because the government at that point realized that um, the, the, smart, the farmers were being taken, uh, taken advantage of. So they put these APMCs in place. Now, as it has transpired, as time goes on, um, there, is an, there is an understanding that there is a lack of efficiency within the APMC system. And, and that's why um, the government wanted to introduce these bills and say, well, we want to bring this uh, into a more efficient system um, and, and have people be able to sell not just within their state, but also nationally. Um, the idea being that if you open up these markets to allow more people in to come in and buy, then you will um, increase competition and therefore the prices would rise, which in theory would work if you had many buyers. Now, the issue arises when essentially you're having these farmers in the majority of cases, these are farmers that have small holdings. Um, there was a BBC article uh, published a few months ago that, that showed that about 68% of all farmers in India had less than one hectare of land. Now, one hectare is about 2.5 acres. So they have one, less than one hectare of, of land. You have thousands of these farmers. And with the, these bills, what you're essentially um, doing is putting the emphasis onto the farmers to go out and trade with large corporations. So you have one, two, three large corporations that are, that are operating and they're the ones that have essentially the power. So they can set the price. If they can set the price, you've got thousands of these, um, you know, farmers going in individually. Um, that essentially puts you in a position of an oligopoly, which is one of the classic market failures within, within free market economies, because you have the oligopolies who have the power to drive the price. And they can essentially drive the price down. That becomes even more relevant when you're, when you see that the MSP, which is the minimum support price, the floor price for the product is not being uh, is not included within the bills. So the floor price of the product can be driven even further down. You add on to that hoarding. So um, essentially, I as a large private buyer can come to the farmers and say, I'm going to buy 10 million tons of crop in, in this year. Uh, when it comes to next year, because I've stored, stored all of that crop, when it comes to next year and, and the farmers want to send, sell me the same 10 million, I already have 10 million in it stored up. So I don't need that much and I can drive the price down. So you see where, the, where some of these issues are, are, are coming from. The other part of this is that the reason that they wanted to bring this in is they said, well, private buyers want to get involved in the market and, that, and that's fine. But even, even without these bills, private buyers could buy directly from the farmers. The, the, um, the safe holding or, or kind of like the, the, the part that, that was um, beneficial for the farmers is if the private buyer came to them with a price that was lower than the M MSP or they were being asked to um, you know, sell a certain amount, they could go back to the APMC and be guaranteed a minimum price. So they had a bargaining um, bargaining power there. But if you're removing all of those kind of safeguards as an individual farmer with 2.5 acres who is going against a large corporate, corp, um, corporate company, you have limited bargaining power. In addition to that, we have the corporate, um, sorry, the contract farming uh, piece. So this is allowing private buyers to enter into um, agreements with with these farmers in terms of what they expect the farmer to produce and they will then buy for the next year. What the contract farming allows for is um, the corporation, the private buyer, will provide the input um, 
So that's the, the seeds, the fertilizer, the agrochemicals, um, all the tools. They can provide all of that input and they will also pay for the output, which essentially puts the farmers in a contract farming position, which we know um, from what we've seen within the U.S. has not it is not an ideal situation. And a lot of these smaller farmers essentially end up selling their product um, and becoming um, part of, um, you know, and these smaller farms become part of a lot larger corporate corporate company. So those are some of the issues when it comes to the actual um, farming, farming bills. Um, now, this has been, this was done um, in terms of the re removal of the APMC in Bihar in 2006. Um, and the, the, the information I have on the slide is from 2013. However, I think the indications and, and kind of the, what, we, what we've seen within um, the Indian market, I think is still relevant even now, even though the data is, is a couple of years old. So in Bihar, um, they removed the APMC in 2006. And what that essentially meant was you allowed farmers to be able to sell outside of the mundi, bring, you know, bring more buyers in, increase investment into the farming um, process, the agricultural process, um, allow for efficiencies, drive the price up, etc. That did not happen. What actually ended up happening is that although between 2006 and 2010, the prices um, that the Bihari farmers were receiving it increased after 2010, the income um, of the Bihari farmers actually dropped quite significantly. Um, and it led to, um, and what they found when they did the analysis is the overall, out, the overall cost of the um, produce, so the overall cost to the farmers was increasing, the overall value was increasing, but the overall income was decreasing. And as many people um, who you know may well have links back to India will will, will know, is that um, Bihar, in terms of the um, their farming, a lot of Bihar individuals will actually travel to places like Punjab and Haryana to work in Punjab and Haryana because the monthly income that they are receiving in Bihar working on their own farms is is. So um, it is a lot less than what they potentially can receive by working on somebody else's farms in, in Punjab and Haryana. So again, that's another part where we've seen this previously that this has not worked because the APMC did not allow for, um, sorry, removal of the APMC did not allow for additional um, um, additional uh, buyers to come in and therefore did not allow for competition. Therefore, you're, you're then dealing with one or two strong players in the market and you are essentially, um, you know, they're driving the price because it's a demand, it, it's, a, it's a buyer based um, market system. <clears throat> so those are, with, those are some of the, uh, those, are, those are essentially the main issues that have, have been occurring within, um, with, with, the, um, <coughs> with the protest, uh, with the bill, sorry. Now, from, um, from a national perspective, the protests have been happening for over four, over four months. Um, there was, when these bills were passed in uh, September, there were protests that were happening at a, at a state level. And the state level protests were not necessarily getting the um, attention of central government. So in, at the end of November, um, they started a movement called Dili Jalo, which means let's go to Dili. Uh, so they decided, um, a lot of the farmers decided to, and the farm unions got together and they decided that they were going to go to, go to Delhi and they were going to protest outside Delhi. Um, that's really when this became um, a, a big issue and it actually came to light for me in terms of what this actually means, because we saw um, many instances of many videos and, and pictures of um, lati charges. So these are the basically the police charging the farmers with the bamboo sticks, uh, water cannons, barricades, uh, essentially stopping people from coming from their state to to Delhi to uh, to protest. Um, and bearing in mind that a lot of these um, 
people that were protesting are elderly farmers. So they are in their 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Many of them have been are people who have, you know, far, they farmed for generations. So farming is intergenerational within India. Um, it's passed down from from your, you know, your ancestors. Every generation undertakes farming. A lot of these individuals that are the senior individuals that are in their, you know, el- you know, elderly age have also been part of um, the army or the armed forces in some form. So they are individuals that have, you know, have definitely been able to, you know, um, they know what they're talking about when it comes from a farming perspective. So they were coming to Delhi, they were being stopped. Um, and that's when it really kind of highlighted on, on, on my Instagram and my social media in terms of this is, this is a significant issue. And that's where I started to learn, learn more about it. Now, from an Indian media perspective, what has been shown is that these uh, protests are really only happening in Delhi, and they're really only happening in Punjab and Haryana. Now that isn't that isn't true, and we've seen um, and the image on the uh, left hand side of the screen actually shows where all of the protests that happened in January, where all of the protests took place, and they've been taking place across the country because in nationally all farmers are uh, affected by this, uh, and some of the images on the right hand side, you know. Farming, farmers are protesting in Gujarat, in Bengaluru, in Maharashtra. There was a, a massive protest um, where the farmers actually marched from, um, I think it was uh, Nasik, um, Pune, all the way to Mumbai and were protesting. They, they marched for like three days um, to actually go and protest. So this is not something that is just um, linked only to Punjab and Haryana. Um, it, is, it is something that farmers across the nation are, are protesting. In terms of the impact, um, it's not just the farmers that are being impacted. And you may well have seen some some articles in terms of the majdur, which um, in India, majdur means laborers. Um, a lot of them have been protesting alongside with the farmers because over 50% of the labor in India um, are people who work in agriculture and they're the people who work on farmlands. So if the farmer's income is being reduced, which ultimately these farm mills will, will, will do, if the farmer's income is being reduced, then the income that they are then are able to pay the majdur is being reduced, which then means the income that anyone who is dependent on um, the farmer and the farmer's produce, um, their income is being reduced. So you think about the, the local stores, the local economy around the farmer, the local economy around the majdur, all of that is being um, being reduced as well. So the majdur have been very, very um, uh, vocal, and it's it's really a farmer um, and majdur, a farmer and labourer uh, protest. Now, on the top left-hand side, you'll see an image of Shiv Kumar and Nodi Kaur. Both of them are um, activists, they're Dalit right activists, and they have been... Um, protesting. Um, they were also uh, arrested by the police and, and uh, later, um, I think, freed on, on, on bail, well, released on bail. Um, but they were protesting about the, the fact that the farm bills are um, unjust and also just uh, protesting in terms of the treatment of how the farmers have been treated, how the protesters have been treated. Um, in the bottom left-hand corner, that's an image from... Um, actually uh, Karnataka, and there's a couple of images from Karnataka and Bengaluru where people, and Maharashtra rather, um, where people are actually protesting, female women um, farmers are protesting. A lot of the people that are um, working on the farms, um, at least 65% is that in, as that other image says, at least 65% of women in rural India are actually working on farms. So again, if the farmer's um, income is declining, where do you think that impact is going to happen? That's going to happen with the, with the females, most with the women most of all. We've seen, um, so the women farmers have been protesting alongside the Majdur. Um, the bottom uh, middle image is actually the image of the uh, transgender activists in Mumbai supporting the farmers and in terms of their protests. Um, it's also important to note that these protests have not been taken um, lightly by the local government, um, or rather, rather by the central gov- central and local government. And there's been a lot of um, instances of uh, police violence. Um, 
internet shutdowns, um, you know, stopping uh, water supplies, arresting um, not just activists, but also arresting um, journalists. There was a journalist in Dipunia who was also arrested. Um, so there's been a lot of this kind of trying to stop the flow of information and trying also to um, bring in uh, propaganda that that does not provide the clearest image of what is actually what is actually going on within these uh, within these protests. So in February, at the start of February, um, there was a huge explosion of information on Twitter, and this was largely led by Rihanna. Um, Rihanna on February 2nd um, said she said, why aren't we talking about this? Which, to be honest, is, is what a lot of us had been feeling like. Um, and I know people in India had been actively posting about this. A lot of um, the South Asian diaspora in, in the West have been actively posting about this for, for quite some time. And, and many of us were feeling like, why aren't we talking about this? So Rihanna's tweet kind of exploded the conversation and Greta Thunberg and, and Kamal Bell, Mina Harris, um, Juju Smith. I mean, there's, there's been many, many tweets. I mean, Su Sarah, um, Susan Sarandon as well. People have tweeted about why are we not talking about this? Why are we not um, raising the conversation about the farmers' protest so that it gets to that media level? And there's been, following those uh, tweets, there has been more information that's been available on CNN, on the BBC, um, and I think what essentially is very important to highlight is the activism that was driven by the um, the activists in India. And I know Kanubri is going to speak about the activism in India shortly, but the, the activism that was driven by those individuals in India did manage to bring it out um, in terms of raising it to the Western spotlight. And we definitely need to keep up that activism and definitely need to keep that message going because the farmers are still there. The Mujdur is still there. The women protesters are still there. I mean, it's been over four months. They're still protesting. Um, a number of individuals have actually died during the protests. And I think it's, um, you know, it, they're, they're not going to go away. They're not going to um, just leave. They want a resolution to this because they're essentially fighting for their livelihoods and they're fighting for the food that is going on every one of our plates. Um, so it's really important that we continue to, to drive that, that activism. From a CASA aid perspective, um, in terms of what we're doing um, on the ground, so CASA aid has been um, in Delhi um, and actually has been in Maharashtra as well, but a majority of our support has been in Delhi um, along the three uh, protest sites, which is Tikri Singhu and Ghaziabad. Um, there's, those are the three um, three or four protest sites that, so Khalsa Aid has been there providing, just essentially providing essentials, providing some level of dignity and humanity to the farmers that have have um, arrived there, the protests that have arrived there to protest um, with some dignity, providing them clean water, providing them shelter. I mean, when these individuals came to um, came to Delhi, they came in November. Now, if anyone has been to India in um, December and January, those are the coldest months in Delhi, the coldest months in Delhi. Um, and these individuals, they're elderly, they are 60, 70, 80 years old. They're sleeping outside, literally on the ground. Um, and they have, they have nothing. So, but they're there because they really believe, they really believe that what they're doing is the right thing. So I think that's important to, to, to recognize is if they're, they're there, they're there because they really believe in, in and they're passionate about it. So what Casa Aid did was we, we set up um, water tanks providing clean water. Uh, we created um, shelter homes for them so that they could be sleeping in somewhat of a, of a you know, inside environment, even though it's not really inside, but at least they would be, you know, pre protected from some of the elements. And, and as we move into summer, with Delhi becoming incredibly hot over the next um, couple of months, we'll, we're working to provide some level of um, kind of support and, and just dignity there as well. Um, a lot of the protesters are female. Um, so, you know, we're providing hygiene kits, um, we're providing laundry services, you know, being able to have a shower, being able to wash your clothes, um, providing laundry services to females when they are, you know, going through menstruation. I mean, that's a really important key part of it. Um, that's also something that we're providing. Um, we have 
what we call um, the Kassan Mall, which is essentially a location. It's a, it's a marketplace where uh, farmers can go and actually acquire goods for free. They don't have to pay for anything. Um, they can go and, and, you know, get a shawl, get a blanket, get, you know, supplies that they need. Um, the whole premise is that we we need to, you know, as a humanitarian organization, we recognize um, that we need to stand in solidarity with the protesters. We recognize that so the protesters need our support in terms of, you know, just the ability to to protest in a dignified manner, um, as well as the humanitarian impact. I mean, as we move through these these farm bills, the um, income of the farmers is going to decline, which means the rich are going to get richer and the poor are going to get poorer. So that inequity is going to increase, which is in an, in and of itself a humanitarian issue. And there are many many issues that kind of transpond, you know, kind of launch off from that from that perspective. Um, so, you know, as I said, uh, water, shelter, safety, fire extinguishers, um, laundry, shower facilities, those are all things that Carthage has been providing. There are other also, also um, other organizations that are on the ground are also providing amenities to support um, to support some of the, uh, some of the protesters as well. So um, just to kind of end, end my talk, I mean, you know, this is a very quick and brief uh, run through of the farm bills. Um, there's a lot of information available online in terms of going into the depth of what the farm bills are about. Um, there's also a lot of information in terms of what we can do um, in the West to provide support. And, and, you know, many times, and I've gone through this myself, you sit there and you think, well, I want to provide some support to um, the farmers. What can I do? I'm sitting in the West. I mean, activism and, and posting and reposting is definitely something that I think we uh, in the West can do um, and also be, be become more educated on what the issues are so that we can speak to these issues in a, um, in a clear and a, in a succinct manner. Um, so with that, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, I'm, I'm sure there will be questions, but I want to hand over to Kanu Priya so that um, she could speak to, um, to, her, um, to her piece on um, the uh, activism. Um, thank you. Hello. Hi, everyone. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Tisha, for the introduction. And thank you all for having me here to speak on the farmers protest that is uh, happening in India after uh, thousands of farmers are protesting against the new agricultural law uh, that has been passed by the central government of India. So um, although India has uh, uh, been quoted federal uh, sort of governance and uh, the agriculture sector comes as a state subject, but uh, the central government by surpassing it and that too, uh, as Manfred told in times when it was uh, COVID and uh, not all parliamentarians were present there and in uh, presence of um, a lot of dissent uh, inside the parliament, they passed these as ordinances and uh, Later, these turn in form of act, which are now enforceable. And uh, farmers, uh, farmers knew this coming in January. This ordin these ordinances, though being passed in June, the farmers knew about these ordinances. And uh, uh, and uh, then the after the pass after after they passed the, these bills out of hurry and amidst the pandemic, the farmers started protesting in their villages from their villages marching to Delhi with a call of Delhi Chalo. And yes, I want to make this clear here that uh, the farming all over in India uh, is suffering, was suffering through a crisis where there was a lot of uh, farmers suicide on record. And uh, uh, despite of this uh, worsening condition of agriculture, these bills were passed and the Dissent came from the states like Punjab and Haryana, which were majorly the wheat and rice producing bills and the bills which received MSP for uh, these crops. And uh, MSP is basically the minimum support price. So the minimum is the maximum the farmers get from the government on procurement. 
And uh, APMC is a term that I want to make it clear uh, before uh, going to the farm bills that Agriculture Produce Market Committee is the is a is a public Monday is a public place for the procurement of uh, food grains and the farm produce uh, from the farmers to the to the public uh, to the public public institutions. So uh, why are these farmers protesting in India due to these uh, three new uh, uh, laws that have been passed and uh, have been portrayed as uh, delivering freedom to the farmers, while uh, the farmer says that this uh, is giving freedom more to the corporates, benefit to the corporates, not to the farmers. So these acts are projected historic reforms by the government, which uh, uh, promises freedom to the farmers from APMCs, that are the public uh, mandis, and the middlemen who charges commission from trade in these mandis, but uh, the farmers argue that these give freedom only to the corporates. So of the three laws that have been passed and explained very well by Manpreet, I would uh, add uh, an additional uh, uh, thing to it that the one uh, law that is, there was a second one, the Essential Commodities Act, which was passed by the government, allows the unlimited stocking and therefore there'll be artificial price fluctuations decided by the hoarding company. So these price fluctuations actually affect the consumers so much so, and uh, as well as it also puts the food security of a country in danger. So this, this, this one act of, of the three acts actually uh, derived the support to this moment from the various walks of life, whether they were students, activists, teachers, um, or uh, lawyers. So all of them came for their solidarity uh, in the moment by participating in it and contributing in many ways. And moreover, the political scenario in India has already sharpened the politics inside the educational campuses uh, of uh, Punjab and Haryana and even in other states is so sharpened by the uh, present political scenario that the mobilization on ground uh, was uh, made by the student uh, very well and it played a key role in mobilizing on ground while also the conscious use of social media platforms uh, amplified the dissenting voices on ground. So. Uh, that's the mix of ground and the social media approach which the students uh, heard and used so that the movement not just uh, is there on the ground but is there amongst the people living across the borders and uh, is amongst the people who chose not to see what is happening. And uh, the next part of the explanation that I would be uh, giving to this moment is uh, central around the term border. So like, for example, we all are sitting uh, across the border and uh, there is a border between us, as Belibar said, that borders are not just the end, but they are in the middle, they are in between. So to, to just uh, wrap up this entire moment, I think border as a concept uh, would make it easier for you and uh, let's just start uh, with the very immediate border that uh, was physically there in India, uh, in the villages of Punjab, the toll plazas, uh, which the farmers occupied uh, as a first step to resist and to put their dissent against, uh, against these farm bills. And these toll plazas were basically uh, uh, set there by the private agencies to collect toll for building the road, for road maintenance. And since then, uh, since the farmers have started this movement in September of uh, 25 in Punjab and uh, September of 4 in Haryana, the toll plazas are all shut and these borders are reclaimed by the villagers, by the people of Punjab and Haryana. And uh, the next border, is the cultural border, the cultural border between Punjab and Haryana. So uh, since 26th of uh, November, thousands of uh, farmers, primarily from Punjab and Haryana, have been protesting against this uh, controversial farm laws and the protests uh, 
uh, as a part of a Delhi Chalo, uh, like going to Delhi, uh, this this call was given by farmers, and they uh, this 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 call uh, actually replicated and uh, actually actually produced another unity between two different cultures between the physical border of the two states punjab and haryana as well as their cultural differences too so both of them uh, with their coordinated efforts um, after bearing all that the police had to do with tear gas water cannons with the uh, lati charge with the uh, with barricade barricading and uh, with even uh, trying to arrest the uh, the activists a day before the march they they tried every means and but they failed and uh, they failed uh, at strengthening this border between the two states and uh, the moment has actually uh, developed a, a relation uh, a very deepened relation and has revived in fact the relation which the two states shared uh, before the political uh, division and the political uh, enmity was brought to the, brought to them the other border that uh, i would uh, talk about is invisible one but definitely a very important uh, border uh, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of the uh, present scenario in india where the women are limited to their kitchens to their households this border uh is very immediate uh, to the women this is very uh this is this is in, in in the household spaces this is in the uh intimate spaces this is in the um uh, in the spaces where uh, we usually think the border is not but for women who were not allowed to uh, step outside their household chores and uh, uh their life uh, between those four walls of the house they that the border was uh, broken in this moment the barricades were thrown by the women farmers and the women especially from the rural uh, parts of uh, punjab and haryana and uh, they joined the movement in number and not just contributed but they uh, they made sure that their presence is there with the contribution and with their key role in uh, running the movement uh the moment while it was in its very initial phases was uh, questioned on its sustenance that why that uh, if the movement would sustain itself or not but uh, due to the efforts of uh, these farmers then these organization like khalsaid and others uh, the movement not just has sustained itself but it has also sustained sustained other living around the protest site the migrants living around the protest site so uh, the 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 movement is surviving on uh, uh, not just the contribution of uh, men alone but the women who have broken those barricades and borders uh, in their houses and uh, they have joined the movement in large number the final border and uh, this uh, border in actually was uh, broken on 26th of january but uh, was reinforced and uh, quite strengthened uh, post 26th the republic day of india and uh, this border is the delhi border and the delhi border is uh, not just uh, one single border but uh, singu border tikri border shahjapur border gazipur border as well as chilla border these five borders were reclaimed by people they all uh, blocked these uh, huge highways with their trolleys with their uh, temporary homes with their uh, uh, setup like uh, for uh, protesting there and these borders actually define how there is a world that there there there's two sorts of world uh, living across these borders on one side the police uh, is there with their guns with their barricading with their sharp nails that they have uh, uh, dug down uh, in the ground so that the farmers don't uh, march with their tractors uh, anymore to the inside of the delhi and uh, on the other side the farmers sit there with their uh, uh, with their uh, with their, i would say that most of the farmers there have already planted their flowers and 
already there uh, set up with the community kitchen and are feeding uh, the communities around them. So the, uh, the difference is very stark and the intention of the uh, people across the borders is uh, clearly seen that the people on the side of the protest are there to fight for their dignity, for their land, while those across the border, the Delhi government, the central government is there to loot away their land and dignity and hand it over to the uh, private companies, to the corporates who, um, who are uh, more close to the government in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of uh, their uh, political uh, presence, in terms of their economic models. So uh, the the, the, this is how I, I think the movement can be together compiled uh, in terms of border, like how the borders in between have been broken and uh, by the people and how they have joined together from different states for their issue. Now, the role of students and youth has been uh, immense in the movement. Uh, they have not just uh, worked for the mobilization, but uh, the state uh, government uh, have been vigilant and have been uh, uh, have been making arrests of these uh, activists on ground. Uh, the young uh, climate ac activist Bisha uh, uh, Ravi, along with Shantanu Muluk and Nikita Jacob, uh, they were uh, they were arrested and accused uh, of sedition, criminal conspiracy, and intent to riot uh, and uh, other crimes as well. So these these three climate activists were, uh, if doing anything for this movement, was uh, taking this movement online, uh, as well as uh, uh, otherwise protesting against the uh, climate change. Uh, so this is how the government deals with the with the youth and with the young when they are aware and when they come out for others. Uh, the other two activists, which Manpreet has already talked about, like is Shiv Kumar and Nodeep Kaur, and uh, both of them being very young, Majdur, that is labor activist, and uh, they were working uh, in this protest site, uh, not just in support of farmers, but taking up the labor issues as well. And uh, they, 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 they had to face severe custodial torture and uh, Shiv Kumar had to go through PTSD as the head of uh, Haryana police. Uh, and, uh, and this was all without proof, without any warrant that they did. And uh, Nadeep Kaur was beaten by male policemen and was sexually harassed in the custody. And uh, so uh, there are, uh, so there were so many uh, young people from Punjab and Haryana arrested by the Delhi government too, uh, who have been released but are not free at all because they all have to uh, spend money and go back to Delhi on their dates uh, they are called for and they are still stuck in the in that process where they are not free and the government has, uh, uh, in fact. Uh, given them this uh, long rope so that they uh, catch hold of them while after the movement or maybe when they plan to crush the movement uh, uh, in coming days. Uh, so uh, the youth has also played a political role in this movement. The movement uh, while uh, was on the Haryana border was uh, uh, stopped by some of the Kisan and the farmer leaders, but the youth made sure that they don't stop, they don't stop uh, uh, at the border of Punjab, but they Punjab and Haryana, but they they march to Delhi and they sit and reclaim the space that belongs to them in a democratic uh, country. So this fight uh, that is uh, going on, this struggle, uh, is amidst uh, a COVID uh, pandemic that uh, that that has come to us as a as a shared trauma and. Uh, uh, this uh, fascist regime of India, the BJP RSS, uh, which is Hindutva in nature and has been uh, uh, facilitating, facilitating the corporatization of various sectors, which has demonized the public sector so much so that the private companies and the corporates replaces, replace it totally. So uh, the results we see are that the health system, the public health system is in uh, is, is totally damaged and the second wave is here and uh, uh, we are not able to manage 
it at all and uh, uh, people still find motivation still find some inspiration from their history the history of uh, their land where uh, uh struggles such as mujara leher and the freedom struggle and the recent movement of uh, uh, uh of uh, citizens against the nrc and ca has uh, uh, taught them as inspired them to uh, register their dissent to get on the streets with number and uh, uh, reclaim what is theirs and the fight is also inherited by the heroes of the land like bhagat singh and then sir chotu ram of haryana so um, i think uh, getting the account of the historical struggle uh, is very well it uh, won't be able to compile all those moments here but uh, in short i would say all these moments uh, happening in uh, the past uh, which the farmers recall at the protest site were to fight for their land fight for their dignity and this moment is no different this moment is as well uh, fight against the uh, against the uh, the the uh, the corporate the uh, illegal uh, uh, acquirement uh, of uh, occupation of their land to these corporates to the private companies but uh, the farmers are uh, the farmers are uh, sure that they are uh, not going to go back with any sort of amendment any sort of uh, uh, amendment in these act but uh, with the repeal of the three acts they are firm on their stand and uh, have uh, represented their stand um, uh, in the meetings which happened with the agriculture minister but for the past i guess one and a half months or so in fact uh, for the past uh, two months there has been no meeting with the government there have been only uh, Mm, i hear say of the compensational plans that have come to people but people are not ready to move an inch back uh, uh, without getting the farm bills repealed uh, because uh, this threatens their livelihood this threatens their dignity and uh, life uh, so the present moment is still there and uh, is is bound to be there for the country to exploit uh, Uh, its uh, workers, its farmers, students, and uh, others as well. So this is high time that uh, uh, we share solidarity with the farmers. We share our resources with the farmers, and uh, uh, that's the only hope the other working people around in the India, the exploited classes around in the India, are having because no protest could ever sustain itself for so long, and there have been already more than three seventy deaths. on the protest site and uh, after all this uh, uh, the people are firm that uh, they uh, want the laws to be repealed and there's no going back uh, without it so uh, that's about the presentation i am uh, open to the questions uh, thank you so much i would conclude with the two slogans that are the uh, that are the that you may very uh, easily hear on the social media platforms or on the ground that is the kisan mazdoor ek ta zindabad uh, that the long live unity of the farmers and the laborers uh, which uh, is uh, actually uh, not to the ground but uh, the efforts are being made by uh, both the farmers and the mazdoors we see nadeep kaur and uh, shiv kumar making equal effort to unite the laborers and get them to this uh, uh protest sites in solidarity with farmers so kisan mazdoor ek ta zindabad and uh, inqilab zindabad long live revolution thank you so much awesome thank you so much uh i loved our closed captioning attempting to <laughs> translate the zindabad and write that out that statement um <laughs> very inaccurate but thank you so much um we do have a few questions The first one is what are the effects of the protest on the Indian government have there been any policy changes or any responses and that is open to either one of you uh so um uh, yeah let, let's take it together manpreet so the question is uh, what are the effects of uh, protest on the indian government so um the indian government uh, uh where is and was quite busy last month uh, with elections india has a electoral democracy where the 
uh, India finds, uh, where the Indian government finds it easy to sneak away with any issue and just divert it to the elections, to the to manufactured uh, terrorist uh, actions, uh, which uh, take over the television platforms. Uh, but uh, fortunately, because of our people on social media, because of uh, you all uh, conducting such seminars, the movement continues on uh, social media platforms as well as ground and uh, does not uh, dim away from the public eye. And uh, the uh, other part of the question where uh, the Vihana and uh, others have been uh, tweeting uh, on these events, why issue in the past? Um, yeah, I think uh, this this part of the question, Manpreet would be better able to answer because uh, me being in India, uh, I, I can uh, better talk about the ground activism. So, yeah. yeah, so I think from a from a government perspective, um, the you know the the tweets that came. So I think essentially what what was happening when when the protests started is that the government was was trying really hard not to kind of bring that out to light and actually change the narrative that was being portrayed by the media. When um, the Rihanna put, uh, tweet came out and then the subsequent tweets that followed from 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 there, um, there was definitely a push by the the government and the um, their their media to kind of defame um, the people who were protesting. So there was a lot of, and you may well have seen it in, in the media, there was a lot of um, subsequent retaliatory tweets. Um, and then there were protests in in the street, which I think further led to, you know, other protests happening. Um, I my, my personal feeling on this is that the government really believes that um, the farmers will get fed up. Um, the West will get fed up. People will um, just get bored of the, the protest, and um, they'll everyone will just just go home, um, and they can just then move ahead and, and continue with with the, the farm bills that they put that they put in place. Um, and I think what we need to do is uh, continue with the activism and continue with highlighting this. And it has been going on for four months. It is a long time, but the protesters are still there. Um, and they're not going to go home. So um, from from a government perspective, they, from what I've seen, haven't changed anything, but we just need to continue putting that pressure on and um, continuing to, to raise that uh, flag within the West um, as much as possible, because the change is only going to come, really, if the West pressures the change. It's not going to come um, organically from, from the Indian government. Perfect. And I think that sort of beautifully segues into the next question, which is, um, she asked, Manpreet Gore mentioned Rihanna and other celebrities speaking on reposting on Twitter about these events. Why has this gained so much Western spotlight compared to other South Asian socio-political issues in the past? Um, so is the question about whether this um, form of protest, or do you mean, um, Rihanna's tweet versus South Asian tweets. I think I think they're referring to the protests themselves. Um, I know it is a question that has been has been asked. I mean, there's been other issues in India with the CAA, um, the the Kashmir uh, issue as well. And why has that not been pushed on the forefront? And why is this suddenly, um, you know, something that the, the West is, is interested in? And I think it really, my personal feeling, and this is just, this is what I sense, and it's not that I've done any analysis on this, but I think that the, um, the reason that this has come to light is there is a huge um, Punjabi Haryana diaspora across the globe. And, they have raised that flag within the West um, and they've tweeted and they've been passionate. And I'm not saying that people within, you know, the other, um, uh, the other areas are not, are not that passionate, but I think that is part of it. I think the other thing is that this is actually transcending all of India. So it's not just a state issue or it's not just a religion issue or, or a cult, uh, community issue. It's, it's trans transcending everyone. Um, and I think that is another reason, you know, it, there is a lot of, there's a sense of, you know, a huge level of injustice 
especially when you see the farmers that are there, the, the muzur that are there, that are the elderly. So I think that is also driving that level of injustice and, and kind of we need to speak out for them um, in the West. And then that has kind of raised it, it raised it to the level um, that the West is now is now picking up on it. Uh, yes, I would like to add on that uh, structural and uh, uh, institutional changes. Uh, there was this question uh, there. So uh, uh, India has been replacing its uh, its public structure with uh, the private ones. It has been demonizing its public structures. For example, um, there are uh, mm, uh, there are there, there, for example there were so many public schools around here. But uh, uh, what they did is they demonized them. They uh, did not. Uh, Mm, paid the teachers well. They 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 removed the teachers. They did not. Uh, 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 they did not have the student teacher ratio and then other problems. So after demonizing those uh, public structures, they established the uh, private schools to us, to all of us here. And uh, our parents could not, uh, but only uh, could could not make any other uh, choice uh, of a public school, but only enroll us to the private ones because they were the better. So this is how they work. They demonize the public structures, and same is with the farmers' uh, problem that they are trying to uh, demonize the APMCs, the mandis, which are set by the uh, by the uh, by the state governments and the central government. It's it's majorly by the state government, state government. So the by by demonizing those mandis and not reforming them because the farmers have been for long demanding reforms in the APMCs structures and they have been uh, demanding uh, reforms in the present public structure but uh, just by uh, giving and allowing and facilitating the entry of the corporates and establishing their mandis uh, providing private mandis and providing private spaces for these farmers to um, to just uh, uh, get their farm produced there and uh, get it sold for a better price in the first initial days because that is the time when the farmers would actually demonize the public public uh, institution, but uh, choose the private one. But eventually, would end up in a circle of uh, debt, which which they already are. Although, but this uh, uh, if this, any structural change that could be made out of this moment is to strengthen the public structure and to uh, minimize uh, as much as possible the entry of the private uh, players uh, in this, because. Uh, 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 there, there is this uh, entry of player, private players in many co the countries. So for example, it must be there in US, but there is a lot of uh, security net provided to the farmers, while the farmers here have no security net of that sort. If their farm produce get uh, uh, get get, uh, um, they they do, they are not able to produce as much as it was asked for or as much as they expected. So there's no security net of that sort uh, present here in India, which has led to a lot of farmer suicide here. So the structural changes uh, would be to strengthen the public, uh, uh, the, the, the public sale and the public uh, institutions of uh, India, uh, whether it is in farming or is it, it is in, uh, it is in this, uh, uh, it is about hospitals or whether it is about educational institutes. Awesome. And then I have one question as well. So, Gurupriya, you were mentioning the way that students have been involved um, as activists in India. But then, Munpreet, you were also mentioning how it really will take a Western spotlight and a Western push to, you know, really incite some sort of change. So do you have any insight as to why the Western spotlight is seemingly more successful at, you know, sort of persuading the government than maybe the actual protests and activists in India themselves? Um, I'll just uh, talk about uh, how it changed us, um, changed materially for us. Like we were at the protest site and Nodeep was arrested on January 12th. And uh, sadly, this uh, incident happened in presence of uh, uh, in presence of the farm leaders, and uh, it was in their eye. It, they knew that this is happening. That a Mashtur activist has been ar arrested, and uh, she was arrested for the reason that she she was protesting at the other side, very close to the protest site, uh, in support of the laborers. But nobody 
in that 10 km stretch could save nodeep uh, sadly we could not we did not know about it and uh, when we got to know about this news this uh, uh, she was already arrested and shiv kumar was detained forcefully while he was not even present at that protest site he was president of that union but he was not even present at that protest site but he was accused of so many charges and he had to go through uh, custodial uh, torture ptsd and everything but um, this could only surface in india as well as uh, on social media after the celebrities posted the people here took the issue uh, in uh, seriously only when uh, celebrities posted about them so uh, some ways uh, this 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 has played a very good role for us but uh, a poor realization that uh, we do not uh, uh, we do not ex- ex- accept our uh, activists and our people when while they work on ground we do not uh, make sure that we are there for them always so the, 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 this i am telling that despite there have been so many efforts to save our people from arrest and from uh, uh, other problems but uh, this has happened and uh, uh, i think uh, manpreet can add more to it uh, in terms of how it changed the social media narrative mm-hmm. yeah no i think the reason that um there was a, a greater reaction to the western tweets um was because this is bringing you know uh, the indian government is trying to put position india as the largest democracy and the stable uh, company, uh country within that area so a good trade partner there's a lot of trade deals that are being implemented right now so obviously if you bring out issues around um human rights around um you know uh, treatment of of individuals and and prisoners in a in a manner that is um is not in line with what the united united nations expects what is not in line with what the west would expect and and many of many countries have said you know we're not going to do trade with a country that tramples on human rights for example so if you have all of these um countries that you wish to do trade with so that you can grow your economy if those western countries are now saying well, hold on a minute um you're not treating your people right you're not behaving in the manner that we would want to partner with you like we don't want to partner with somebody who does all of this then that's going to cause a a a bigger reaction um and a change than unfortunately activism within the country and it should be that if your people are frustrated and they are on the streets protesting that you as a country leader should listen because you are in a demo- like a democracy is is for and by the people it is not you know it is led by the people so you're in place because of them not in spite of them and and that's and that i think is something that indian government needs to realize so that's how it should be but it isn't um and it is the west and the western spotlight because of all the trade deals and the image of india outside that um that that allowed you know um the the tweet by riana to to kind of explode things and 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 lead to some change now um there have been instances in the past um where things have happened within india that have not come onto social media and have not been seen and witnessed and experienced by the broader western um media and have not been um you know raised to that level and i think what needs to be understood is that you know now with social media now with everyone's on phones we need to keep on top of this we need to keep pushing because we cannot allow um human rights to be just trampled on and democracy to just be trampled on um it needs to it needs to continue and the west has a big big part to play in that the uh, the question which was there um by anita uh, and uh, regarding the us sectors and how their support on the uh, farmers so uh, while uh, these actors and influencers in the west were posting about the farmers movement the indian celebrities were made were made to post uh, against this propaganda so their tweets had a similar language almost uh, copy paste language and all of it was posted on social media to uh, to counter the narrative that was built by the diaspora or by the western uh, celebrities in support of the movement so that's how the bollywood celebrities uh, uh, 
even when if they with, if they were from punjab or if they were in parliament they did the same and with their uh, parliamentarian uh, participation is uh, more hand in hand with the government they have been uh, there with them and uh, working with them and have not been vocal the ones who were vocal uh, i count their name the uh, tanu uh, 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 tapsi pannu tapsi pannu did a great job but uh, eventually her uh, her as well as anurag kashyap for how it was uh, rated by executive um, so ed so that, that's how uh, it is here in india if you raise voice you will be caught in some other charges or some other manufactured uh, uh, crimes against you might come on your door and uh, that's why uh, the celebrities although they have so lot of uh, global uh, uh presence uh, especially, especially people like priyanka chopra they are they are, they are all around they they the the flag bearer of uh, india's uh, um india's uh, people and uh, india's uh, i don't know what, what what how to describe that all valor that they take with their name to the other countries but they were not there when this moment came up and instead they played a role uh, to reverse the effect that the uh, uh that the western culture or the uh, influences had created okay perfect and unless we get another question um this will be the last one and it's what has been the impact of covid-19 on the protests and you know day to day workings uh, so uh covid-19 um um i would give i would try to answer this question uh, uh, individually as well as how it has operated there in protest side the 25th of september was sorry the last day when i wore mask because post 25th september it was huge it was huge no mask or social distancing was spare uh, us from covid the uh the way uh, we marched to delhi on 26th of november and the way it was there the protest had to sustain itself with community kitchens and with sharing with sharing beds with sharing sheets with sharing everything and and that's good in fact i mean sharing is good it it was sort of begum pura without like that's the one word which uh, was uh, given to the moment that there is no sadness everybody shares there's no private property so uh, but despite uh, uh, this uh, the covid and the pandemic uh, was there so this was uh, making people anxious because there was uh, there was uh, age group uh, above 40s in the protest side most of the farmers were from the age group of 60 to 80 and they were so old and uh, this was creating anxiety amongst the young young people out there they tried using masks and uh, sanitizers but uh, this was not at all possible but now when the second wave has hit again and uh, there is a feeling of uh, uh, more fear and uh, anxiety amongst the people and uh, the shortage of beds and health facilities is creating a lot of anxiousness among uh, amongst the protesters as well and the farmer leaders are planning uh, hard, uh, they just they just postponed the parliament uh, call today uh, only they they have postponed uh, them going and entering to the delhi uh, to the parliamentary street it's parliament street uh, which they uh, planned to go in the month of uh, may but uh, uh this uh, the the government has to take this into note like india where there's huge population and uh, where uh, social distancing is not uh, possible not even possible and where the health uh, structure is so damaged so damaged that it could not even treat its union minister and uh, uh, forget what is happening here about common man so uh, yeah there's uh, this in this COVID, uh, managing this covid along with this uh, issue Uh, is uh, getting more difficult and uh, uh, i don't know how this will be uh, the statement would be taken by you all but uh, somehow they will be demonizing the protest as well uh, they will be using it to uh, demonize it in a way that they are the spreader they have the super spreader i mean uh, they can have a kumbh mela they can have election rallies in numbers but a uh, farmers protest which is fighting for their rights and which they have delayed on their part they have delayed the justice not the people the people are there for demanding their justice and demanding their rights 
so uh, in coming days the this the situation and uh, answer to this uh, situation will be difficult for the people and for the farm leaders as well like how to manage the protest site and how to manage this uh, uh, this the problem of a pandemic uh, amidst which they are fighting for their rights Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your very insightful answers. Um, and thank you to everyone who has come to this panel. We hope you've learned a lot. I know I have. Um, and once again, thank you so much to Kanupriya and Manpreet for taking the time out of your busy schedules and coming to speak with us. Um, I think attending something like this is a great first step, but you know, it's just the beginning. So if this has been your first introduction into the farmers' protest, thank you so much for coming. But be sure to follow pages like Kalsa Aid or Sick Expo or something else to just continue learning about what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, and if you would like to donate to the work of Kalsa Aid, you can go to kalsaaid.org. Um, everyone who's attended, I'll send an email with a little bit in more information on that. Um, and then for Globe Med, we will be having a bake sale next week. So be sure to look out for a little more information on that. Um, all proceeds will be going to our partner, Amos. Um, and finally, if you've signed up for food, uh, you should have already received an email. If you have not, but you're here, you can still sign up. I'll um, throw the sign up link in the form if you are not in Memphis. I'm so sorry. <laughs> there are no samosas in Lessie for you, but um you have a few spots left so you can um sign up for that and make sure you've logged in with your checkpoint app because we will be checking that as we're handing out food um and those pickups will begin at 6 15 p.m in barrett breezeway but thank you again so much um thank you to all of our thank attendees you.